You may know these moments where someone tries to provoke you and you show a reaction. And you also know the moments where maybe a day or a week later you realize that maybe your first reaction was not either the smartest one or not the best one or not the best one or maybe even both uh, both of these parts of an answer didn't really materialize to be the best of the show you could have given them and we are talking this time about an international case on a really new level of uh, not only provocation but also mistreatment towards uh, minorities and also towards women but they can happen to basically absolutely every group so it can happen to you in business tomorrow we have to know when someone tries to provoke you how do you give smart and appropriate answers and how do you win people who are not on your side because the usual reactions are quite emotional one i just give you an example you 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 receive an email and this email makes you very angry because they they either didn't answer your questions or they didn't behave in the way you wanted or they give you an answer which doesn't answer anything. It's just talking a lot but not saying anything. And then you just think of, okay, I have to make a point here. You hit the answer button or better, you hit the reply all button. Then you're typing something angrily. <laughs> well, and uh, after that you hit send. Then you think, well, I made a point that is necessary in business, as we all know. Well, next morning you come to the office and you're sitting in front of your Microsoft Outlook or whichever email client you use and then you think, hmm, maybe today I would give a better answer to that. And we're talking about exactly these moments in business. Moments where people provoke you and you give them a wrong reaction because that's exactly where they want to have you. What do you do? when someone provokes you in the worst way possible. And we have a case which happened in the United States of America, Congresswoman Alexandria, or Alexandria Cortezio Cortez. So um, when we talk about Alexandria Cortezio Cortez, we are talking about someone who was born in 1989 and already is in Congress of the United States. She's a, she's a Congresswoman at the age of 29. And now think, what have we done at the age of 29? And how would we have reacted if someone tries to provoke you in one way or the other? What happened in the US? Well, what happened is that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez gave a speech, which is in the show notes of this podcast, because, and that rarely ever happens, it is one of the best speeches I heard in a very long time. It is a masterpiece of rhetorical, skillful answer to, the, to an attempt to provoke you to get an emotional answer, only to then tear you down and say, look, you're way too emotional to hold office, probably you should leave. So, what happened? Congresswoman Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez gets called, and I'm sorry for these words, but I have to state the facts, otherwise we don't know what the background is. Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez gets called a fucking bitch by Florida Congressman Ted Yoho. Sorry for the words, just the facts. And um, Ted Yoho did not only use these words when, when this all came to public and he gave a speech about what happened, he not only did not even mention the name of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, he also said... And I quote, I cannot apologize for my passion. So he basically said, I'm going to give you, during an apologetic speech, a non-apology and just walk off with not apologizing for what I've done. And um, not only that, um, Ted Yoho named Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez disgusting, crazy, out of her mind, dangerous, and the two swear words named her a fucking bitch. And when Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez said that he said that he's rude, and I mean that is the politest reaction you can you can you can tell someone when you when you get called these words, then the politest reaction is that you can say you are rude. And the reaction was that. Ted Yeo said, no, you are rude. That's a bit of an elementary school level of discourse. You're rude. No, you're rude. A really poor reaction. And Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez decided to talk to the Speaker of the House and say she needs to address this issue. In the United States, the Speaker needs to be profoundly sure that this is an important issue and he recognized that with one hour of talking time of course when you go on the link in the podcast show notes there are 11 minutes which is the main part of her speech 
But the issue was addressed for one hour in the house. And we are talking about how do you give a proper answer when someone tries to provoke you in the worst way possible. So what did Alexandra Otejo Cortez say? So first she says, his words were not deeply hurtful or piercing to me. And of course you could now say, what kind of opening is that for a speech? When it's not hurtful or piercing, then why are you talking? Why don't you just move on? It's What we have here is a surprising beginning of a speech, which, by the way, is very important to have in my presentation classes and coachings. I always tell people most of your openings are so boring that you lose 90% of the audience within the first 90 seconds or less. So when you say, I have something to address, but these words, and she said before that she was called the F word and B word, but Ted Yeo used the actual words, um, then saying it was not deeply hurtful or piercing to me simply tells people I am not here to give an emotional address of someone who is just emotionally hurt. I'm going to address something else. And from there, we see a masterpiece of a speech. What she then said is, I worked a working class job. I waited tables at restaurants, ridden the subway, walked the streets of New York City, heard these words when being harassed in restaurants, or tossed men out of bars that have used language like Mr. Yoho's. And that is, a, is an excellent start to make your point. She not only says, I walked the streets and I did these jobs, I know how normal life is, and just to give you a bit of a background, because background in this case is very important, uh, Alexandria Ortega Cortez grew up in the Bronx, which we all know is not the best part of New York City. Her degree at the end is a Boston University specialist degree in international relations with a minor in economics. That is good education, that is not elitist education. So, um, she said it was not deeply hurtful or piercing to her. She worked the working class job, she has done all that. And then the, the most powerful point of the beginning is where she said, I tossed men out of bars that have used language like Mr. Yoho's. And that is a very powerful metaphor. Because as soon as you say that, you can see your inner eye shows you, like a movie scene, you see a bar in maybe a good part of town, and you see a waiter who has to chuck out someone who's really drunk, tie off his neck, off his face, yelling and shouting at people. It's really embarrassing. It's one of these moments where the whole bar becomes a bit quiet because you're all so embarrassed or embarrassed by proxy for that person. And she puts Mr. Yoho in that context without saying that Mr. Yoho actually is one of these people. He just says, people that have used language like Mr. Yoho's. It just gives you a very clear context. What are we talking about? And then she says that this is not new. This is the problem. He was not alone. He was walking shoulder to shoulder with Representative Roger Williams. And here we are with the next powerful blow towards the other side of the argument. She said it's not just because people could always say, look, they're always bad apples. You heard of the bad apples argument before. It's people saying they're always bad people. Just move along because you always have to accept that some people in a party are a bit bad. Right. So just move on. Come on. No, no. Ted Yoho said that, and Representative Roger Williams was standing next to it. Something, a, a misbehavior, a misconduct, especially in a professional context, professional misconduct is way worse when people were bystanders not doing anything. They say massive difference when in a, let's say, a football club or a board of directors, an association, a golf club, a, a business, an organization, a charity. It's a massive difference if from that leadership team, no matter in what kind of organization you are, no matter if it's charity or non-profit, for-profit, business, whatever it is, let's say you have a leadership group. When one person of that leadership team conducts or performs professional misconduct, that's bad. But when someone shows professional misconduct and the whole board of directors are standing around, not only seeing what's happening, but just letting the person off with either not apologizing or giving a lukewarm, half-hearted apology where anyone knows that is not even me meant seriously. It is way worse than the bystanders say, oh, come on, this is not really an issue. And she addresses that right here. And she goes on. She says, this issue is not about one incident, it's cultural. And then she goes on, an entire structure of power that supports that. 
And here's now the part where you could say, look, there are a couple of people, but there are hundreds and thousands of people in politics. You can't just blame these two for everyone in the entire system. And then, because to make a point which is powerful enough to say there's a structural approach to professional misconduct, for example, towards women or towards minorities or both, then she comes to a very another very powerful point in her speech. Disrespect, and she, I quote her word by word, Disrespect comes particularly from the Re Republican Party. So that's the point where people could say, look, Republican Party, they are huge. You can't blame the whole party for just a couple of people being a bit weird. But she goes on. The, whole, the full statement is, disrespect comes particularly from the Republican Party, elected officials of the Republican Party. The president told me to go home, where the implication is, you do not belong in America. That is a tremendously powerful statement because she says we go from the broad basis of the party to elected officials of the party to the most powerful person in the world, the president of the United States of America. And then she gives another very, another very specific example saying that the governor of Florida, who is Ron DeSantis, he mentions her, him in her speech, the governor of Florida, Ron DeSantis, called her a whatever that is before she was even elected. And whatever that is, you cannot call another person whatever that is. And now, of course, we have to see what is the background. I gave you the background of, of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and maybe these, these two people, because most people in the UK or in Germany or in Europe or outside the US, most people don't know who Ted Yoho are or Ron DeSantis. These are people known in the US, but hardly outside the US. So are these just two weirdos who, by coincidence pave their way through a grassroots movement or whatever, and suddenly they hold this seed and the whole party is ashamed of them. Well, no, it's not. Just to give you the background, Ted Yoho. Um, Yoho earned his double A degree, Broad Community College, uh, baccalaureate in animal science at the University of Florida in 1983. Thereafter, he went to university of, the University of Florida College of Veterinary Medicine, where he received a doctorate in veterinary medicine. So we have someone who is very well educated. He's a member of the American Veterinary Me Medical Association, the Florida Veterinary Medical Association, the Florida Association of Equine Practitioners, the Florida Cattlemen's Association, and here we go, the National Rifle Association, the NRA, you know, the pro-gun pro lobby whatever you want to call that association. Um, this group that still promotes guns dis despite everything that happened in the US. So here we are, that is only, that is Ted Yoho. And when we talk about Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida, his background is after graduating in 1997, Dundon High School in Dundon, Florida, DeSantis attended Yale University, not the, not the worst place to get your education from, one of the best universities in the world. DeSantis attended Yale University, graduating with a bachelor's degree in history in 2001. Uh, while at Yale, he was captain of the varsity baseball team and a member of Delta Kappa Epsilon and fraternity, which is strongly dominated by men. Um, different presidents came from that maternity, very powerful organization, not really diverse. Um, so a very powerful a very powerful organization supporting him in a very elitist university network. And if you think this is not enough, no, here we are. Um, there's more. After Yale, he joined Darlington School, serving on the upper school history department, and he attended Harvard Law School, receiving his JD in 2005. JD for the international uh, listeners. It's, it's a Juris Doctor. It's a Juris Doctor, basically some sort of a PhD in, 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 in legal, but they have a they have kind of a different education system there. So people who, who, who work for universities could expect could could explain the difference between a PhD and the JD to you, but that's not topic of this podcast today. So we have very educated people who use this language against an elected official, no matter how much you dislike someone, no matter how much you disrespect someone from their politics. And let's face it, I am not a big fan of the politics of Alexandra Ortega-Cortez. I'm a self-employed entrepreneur and Alexandra Ortega-Cortez was, was massively involved in um, taking care that Amazon did not settle in the state of New York, did not create up to 50,000 jobs and about a billion dollars of different kind of revenue for the state of New York because she said we don't have to enter the race to the bottom when it comes to gi giving tax gifts. Well, that's one way how to put it. Congratulations for not having these jobs 
and she still has no solution for how do we get people with less qualification into work, especially in the state of New York, where, any, where hardly any company opens because uh, rent is high, the infrastructure is good, but still everything is way too expensive. Other states offer way better, way better incentives um, and also a way better tax deal. So I'm not a big fan of her. I'm not talking as a democratic fanboy here. I am talking about that it's unacceptable, no matter how much you dislike someone's politics, that you use derogatory language towards them and by that dehumanize them. Because when you say whatever that is, and now here's the point where Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez keeps on going, dehumanizing language happen in a pattern, in attitude towards women, dehumanizing others. And then she says, I'm not hurt or offended, which is important to say and to stress again that she's not making an emotional statement. And then she says, well, I could have just, and then she says, it's just another day, right? She could have just moved on and she was ready to do so until, and that was the point why she spoke up, the non-apology could not be accepted. So Ted Yoho stepping up saying, I cannot apologize for my passion. That was the point where she said, I have to do something about that. Because, and then that's what she says in her speech, I could not allow that to stand. And now comes the most powerful part of her speech, a rhetorical masterpiece in how to give an appropriate and powerful answer, which also wins people from the other side of the political spectrum, and not only your best mates, buddies and friends, it wins everyone who has a, even a fraction of a moral compass left in their body. So what did she say? She said, Mr. Yoho has a wife and two daughters. I am someone's daughter too. My father, thankfully, is not alive to see how Mr. Yoho treated his daughter. My mother got to see Mr. Yoho's disrespect on the floor of this house towards me on television. And I am here because I have to show my parents that I am their daughter and they, they did not raise me to accept abuse from men. And then she goes on with the harm Mr. Yoho tried to levy against me. So, so she clearly says, I am not making this statement for me. She clearly says, I, I am in a position where I could just move on. But she also addresses there are many people who are unable to do so. And that is a very powerful statement, not only for the Democratic Party or the Republican Party or the United States. It's a global statement for if something discriminatory happens in your organization, your business, your club, your association, your charity, your for-profit, your non-profit, your whatever kind of group you are, as soon as you let it allow to happen and let people get off with a non-apology or with a lukewarm half-hearted apology, you commit complicity. Silence is violence and passivity is complicity. You may have heard that in the recent past. So she gives a very powerful point why she speaks here. And she says, I'm not speaking for myself. I'm speaking for the ones who need it more than I need it. So... Um, then she says, um, what Mr. Yoho did was give permission to other men to do that to his daughters. He gave permission to use that language against his wife, his daughters, women in his community. I am here to stand up to say that this is not acceptable. And then she says, and that's a very important point here, I do not care what your views are. This is not negotiable. And now, of course, people will say, oh, but when you have a speech and when you want to invite people to discuss, you have to accept that other people have other views. That is correct when we have a factual disagreement. But let's face it, ending discrimination is not a debate. Ending discrimination is only a debate for the people who want to discriminate, who have an advantage of discrimination and who are part of a privileged group and want to keep it that way. Then she says, I, don't, I, I do not care what your views are, this is not acceptable. Then she says, having a daughter does not make a man decent. Having a wife does not make a decent man. Treating people with dignity and respect makes a decent man. When a decent man messes up, as we are all bound to do, he tries his best and does apologize, not to save face, not to win a vote, he apologizes genuinely to repair and acknowledge the harm done. So even at that point, she still invites Ted Yoho 
to say, look, I have done something wrong. I apologize and we take it from there. And that's a very important point because what she says here is, I'm not here for revenge. I'm not here for blaming someone. I am only here to get justice in place and start positive change. A very powerful statement. If you shame people before for having a different opinion than maybe your leadership team, you already lost that chance. So as soon as you invite people to tell them, if you apologize, we can take it from there, you will always be more successful because you try to get people on board and tell them you have done wrong. But as she says, uh, she says, when a decent man messes up as we are all bound to do. So, so she says it is, it is happening to all of us and it will happen to all of us. But you have to apologize and then we have a foundation to talk from. And a, an honest apology in certain cases also, and I did interviews with Alan Stevens, who is a reputation expert. You often see him on Sky News and BBC. And he said sometimes this apology means that you have to take personal consequences. For example, stepping down from a leadership position um, or leave the position you're in at the moment or step down for a certain amount of, in, in, of, 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 of time. So it can lead to the point that you have to leave a certain position to show that these steps were not acceptable. So now is the point, how do you end a speech like that? And then what do we learn from it? Her, her final part, the final part of that speech is unbelievably powerful because you could, of course, now have a raging and fiery answer where you say it's all unacceptable and we see these are all old white men and blame them all. She could go down that road, but she doesn't. For a very good reason, because she knows that will only make her speech another emotional outbreak where people will say, oh, look, it's an emotional woman. And with a conservative voting electorate, with a conservative voter base, you can always say, oh, the emotional woman, which, of course, is a, is, is, is a blatantly wrong and, and just patronizing, generalizing um, statement. But many people still stick to these stereotypes when they are in the conservative voter base. When you say, oh, the emotional woman, they will just say, oh, yeah, we all know that. Thank you very much. Not interested. And just take it off the box and just take off the box. So what does she say? She says at the end and... The most powerful point, again, comes with the opening of the ending. The first line of her ending was, I want to express gratitude to him. Look, when you have people against you and you criticize them, and at the end you say, I want to express gratitude to him, people will listen because this is a surprising opening to the final part of a speech. You see how important it is to be properly prepared to give these speeches. So what does she say? when we have the complete final statement. I'm going to give you the complete final statement right now. She says, I want to express gratitude to him. I want to thank him to showing the world that you can be a powerful man and a cost woman. You can have daughters and a cost woman with no remorse. You can be married and a cost woman. You can take photos and project an image to the world of being a family man and a cost woman without remorse and with a sense of impunity. It happens every day in this country. It happened here on the steps of our nation's capital. It happens when individuals who hold the highest office in this land admit hurting women and using this language against all of us. So you see, there is no anger, no call for revenge. She doesn't say step down by tomorrow. The only thing she says is what you said was unacceptable and you are an immoral person if you keep your position and go down that road. So what do we learn from that when it comes to corporate speaking or organizational speaking, when you address people in your team, in your business, in your organization, in your charity, whatever you work, wherever you are, when you lead people, you must be able to rhetorically convince them of what you want to convey as a message. And by the way, when some people now say, oh, I'm not really a good speaker, <laughs> This is not a negotiable position. When you say, I'm a bad speaker, bad news for you, you cannot be in the number one leadership position. When you cannot convince people by giving proper speeches, you unfortunately have to step back in the, in the second line and just do work in the background. Today, the skill of public speaking is something you must have. And by the way, when you look at my first speeches, oh dear, I mean... 
I learned it. And you can hear by my charming German accent, this is my second language. I'm doing a, probably at the end, 30 minute long podcast in my second language without any notes except having parts of Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez speech in front of me to give you proper quotations without any errors. So what's your excuse? I mean, you are sitting there, most likely you are a native speaker of the English language. Most likely you grew up with the English language. It is your mother tongue. And you tell me you're not that much of a good speaker so you can't learn it? Or you come along with, oh, I'm more an introvert. I come from northern Germany. We don't talk to anyone, basically. We, di we, we socially distance by the mile by standard. When they told us, oh, socially distance by two meters, oh, I don't want to get that close to people. So, <laughs> look, and we don't have humor. Um, you, you see here that we have to step away from these cheap apologies and um, these made-up excuses because you either are able to convince people by speaking or a leadership position for you will be tremendously challenging if not you are unsuitable as long as you are unwilling to learn how to speak. Of course, some people have more talent. Some people have less talent. There is no question about that. But even Barack Obama, when you see his first speeches, he was not a good speaker. He learned to be a good speaker. You cannot be in a leadership position today and not convince people by the power of your voice. So what do we learn from Alexandra Ote? Ocasio Cortez. And by the way, many will wonder why don't I say AOC? Because Alexandria Ocasio Cortez is sort of hard to pronounce even for native speakers. For a non native speaker like I am, it's probably even more challenging. But AOC, it's just, we talked about dehumanizing language. I'm not going to talk about AOC in this context because that's exactly part of the problem. No one says DT to Donald Trump. So why do we say AOC to Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez? Because that's another part. It's always easier to talk down on some sort of initials, a bunch of letters, than towards a person. And also, some people, I think, even as native speakers, would be unable to properly pronounce Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez. So what do we learn for corporate speaking? Number one, when you start speaking, put the emotions in the back. Speak for that's what Graham Davies, who is probably one of the most well known speaker coaches on this planet, coaching people who are up to prime minister in the UK. Um, always speak from the brain, don't speak from the heart. Many people will tell you, speak your heart out. That is very dangerous because when you speak your heart out, you're going to become emotional, you're going to become angry, and you're going to use language you regret to have used as soon as you look at your speech the next day. Speak from the brain. Second, fact check everything you have done because you have to give detail. What happened? Where did it happen? And why, in your opinion, did it happen? Third, make a very clear point that this is not a one-off coincidence where you say, oh, just some bad apple, because people will immediately get to you and say, oh, you know, bad apples in the basket, blah, blah, blah. Make a very clear point where you can prove that this is a structural approach. Like Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez was saying, the Republican Party, the elected officials of the Republican Party, Donald Trump, the president of the United States, and could name very clear examples where this happens. So number three, tell them why it's not a one-off event and why we need to act on that. Then, very important is that you draw a very clear line. What are you willing to negotiate and what are you not willing to negotiate? She said, I'm not interested in your views. This is not going to be negotiated. She also says, we all mess up and you can always apologize to get to the point that we overcome, which is a very important point here. And the last aspect, always have a very powerful ending. And rhetorically, you must be brilliant when you want to win people who are not on your side of the argument. And that is what Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez did right here. She won the people who are not on her political side. Because the question was not, do we use swear words or not? The question was not, was it appropriate what they did on the stairs of the Capitol? The question is, do you support an immoral person who probably just, no, not probably, who gave permission to use that kind of language towards daughters, women, and wives in their community? And of course, if you're a reasonable person, you don't want to support that. I wish you all the best implementing this in your organization. Happy to chat with you if you want to know any further details. And uh, for today, thank you very much for your time.